So next we'd like to talk a little bit about the total IT spending, and this slide's broken out, uh, Bill, by major and non-major programs, but I think there's a couple things we want to point out is, again, IT spending, especially over the past decades, remain largely flat. That's in a decade, by the way, where the agency's grown by 125,000 employees. So you know we could probably have a whole separate show just talking about uh, IT's ability and struggle to keep up with the consumption on bandwidth and storage and end-use your devices and, and, and applications and lots of things. Um, but, but certainly within the past uh, year or two, it's, it's like it has a precipitate, a little bit of a dip as well. Right, right. So as the population of VA employees grow, so should proportionately the IT spend. Um, maybe not perfectly because obviously IT uh, improves in Moore's right. Law, you know, more bang for your buck. But certainly, uh, if not perfectly, a little bit less. But I think the growth in IT spending is not tracking with the growth of the overall population right. or the top line. Right. And so what that means is on a per employee basis, you're actually spending less year over year over year on a per employee basis. And that's exacerbated, and we're going to talk about this in a little bit, by the forward looking uh, technical debt, which begins to eat away at those discretionary IT dollars because you have must-pay bills and you have a much smaller and smaller and smaller piece available for new ideas, new, uh, new technologies. Absolutely. I think there was a, a Daz for DevSecOps that told me, you build it, you own it. Yeah. Um, and, and not only do you own it, but you incur the uh, development, modernization, and enhancement of that code until it's retired. And I know there's been a lot of attention on the Hill and elsewhere about VA's propensity to not retire legacy applications, right? You're just building on top and creating more technical debt. Exactly. Uh, that was a good discussion, and, and thanks for leading us through the one part of the resource puzzle, which are the dollars, and, and we've talked about how that works. Now we're going to dip down into the other part of the resource puzzle, which are the employees. Uh, I'm going to type, take you on this org chart a journey from the top down into OIT, and I want to show you specifically how people engage and, and interact, and specifically from an OIT perspective uh, to the stakeholders, right? So it's not just about OIT. OIT serves customers internal and external, and we want to understand those relationships because that's meaningful from a, from a budget standpoint and from a, a digital and an industry uh, partner's perspective. So at the top, you can see uh, the secretary, McDonough, and then, of course, we have uh, down underneath him the Deputy Secretary, Dal Remy. And we're not going to walk through all the, all the faces and spaces on this chart, but I'm only going to focus on the ones that relate to specifically to OIT. On the left side, you can see the Office of Electronic Health Record Modernization led by Dr. Terry Adiram. Um, note that the Office of Electronic Health Record Modernization, OEHRM, does not report up to the CIO, but in, fa in fact, and instead reports up to the deputy secretary. And why is that? That's because it's a business and mission system. That's it is right. not an IT system. That's right. Uh, we're going to talk about this more, but uh, the fact is, and I think this is misunderstood by many, they think it's the, the CIO is running this program called um, you know, health record modernization, uh, but uh, in fact, the, that office reports up to the DEPSEC. And you can see the uh, folks that are underneath uh, Dr. Derham. Uh, in the middle there, you see the CIO uh, OIT organization, uh, Kurt Delbeni, and we're gonna talk about his organization, obviously, in following charts. Um, over a little bit right and down the bottom, another example, you see the FMBT IFAMS program that reports up to the VA Office of Management, uh, John Rachowski, who's the Chief uh, Financial Officer. So it makes sense that the, the financial uh, system modernization reports up programmatically and certainly from a change management perspective to the uh, Office of uh, Management. Uh, next you see the uh, TAC reporting up to the um, OALC, Office of Acquisition, Logistics, and Construction. Uh, we talked earlier with Luanda about uh, Michelle Foster and, and the TAC, and you can see here organizationally reports up to Michael Parrish. And then on the right side there, you see the Chief Data Officer for VA, Shamendra Paul, does not report to uh, OIT and the CAO, but instead reports up to uh, the Office of Enterprise Integration. Now we're going to take it down a level to the Office of Information Technology, the CIO's office. And I'm only going to go through the top level um, parts here. There are 
many SESs in the Office of Information Technology. There are a lot of fantastic 15s and, and very powerful uh, staff, but it would take us all day to go through that. So we're just going to go through the top level here. You see um, uh, Kurt Delbeni at the top of the CIO. Uh, reporting up to him is uh, the acting PDAS, which is Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary or Deputy CIO, and then the Chief of Staff. And over on the right-hand side, you see Charles Worthington, who's the Chief Technology Officer. One thing I'd also like to note that uh, in a lot of these assignments, they are uh, temporary or detailed assignments. Uh, it takes a long time for any move in VA HR to actually be reflected in the uh, HR documents of record. So uh, what you'll see are a lot of acting um, you know, assignments it's because you move them out of a current billet into a different billet in order to, uh, frankly, deal with some issues that are of high importance by virtue of the person who just left. Uh, underneath uh, the, the PDAS and the Chief Technology Officer, see on the left, uh, my uh, old uh, position was, was held by Todd Simpson, Deputy Assistant Secretary for uh, Development, Security, and Operations, or DevSecOps, or DSO. Um, you can see that you have uh, uh, Brad Houston, who leads the Account Management Office. We're going to talk a little bit about that, very important office. And obviously, another important office is Paul Cunningham, the Chief Information Security Officer, Office of Information Security. Uh, Paul has announced his retirement and will soon be leaving VA, and of course, that vacancy will have to be filled. Uh, next to Paul, you see John Oswalt, who uh, heads the uh, Chief Financial Officer and heads the IT Resource Management Organization, obviously very important. You know, you have a, an IT Resource Management Organization inside um, OIT inside the CIO's organization because the budget is so large and because it's directly appropriated by Congress, which is different than many of the other agencies. Well, the other thing too, right, is, is uh, OIT is managing an 8,000 plus workforce, largely of 2210s, and uh, federal statute requires that certainly at VA and other places that they be centrally managed by the CIO. Exactly right. Yeah. Uh, then you have Martha Orr, who leads the Office of Quality, Performance, and Risk. And then, of course, Luanda Jones, Office of Strategic Sourcing. We heard from her earlier today, a fantastic interview with Luanda. Thank you, Luanda. And then on the right, you see Dr. Paul Tibbetts, who leads the Office of Technical uh, Integration. Paul's a key guy again because I know we harped on the whole notion of these major systems are business and mission systems, but it, it doesn't mean that IT doesn't have a role. And Paul in the Office of Technical Integration, he's providing that systems integration architecture and Exactly right. Yeah. Before Paul and before that Office of Technical Integration, the issue of interfaces was nowhere to be found in the OIT organization. Sure, you had programs, contracts, development on certain things, certain applications. But what about the connections between those applications? Wasn't dealt with. So um, Paul and the Office of Technical Integration has that job, has that role. It's not only inside VA, it's also the uh, interface between a VA system, for example, electronic health record, and an external system, for example, a DOD health record, and the interfaces between the, uh, the IT systems in VA and Social Security, Department of Labor, Department of right. Treasury, and so forth and so on. So it's a big job uh, that he has, and it's one that here, before Office of Technical Integration it landed on your former desk. You know? Right. Well, and just to give people a feel, right, is one major program, electronic health record modernization, even in the first wave deployment and, and uh, you know, the first uh, capability set, there were over 170 separate interfaces between mm -hmm. uh, the vendor, between Cerner, and between OINT that had to be resolved. Exactly right. Okay, we're going to take another uh, step deeper into the org chart. And what I've shown here is the, the top level of the DevSecOps organization. You see at the top, led by Todd Simpson. Underneath Todd, you see Jack Galvin. And underneath Jack are the pillars across the DSO, or DevSecOps. I've drawn red uh, circles or squares around the organization that you know, would, people would remember from a days past. So on the left-hand side, you see the big uh, red rectangle around an organization that's formerly known as ITOPS. Inside the IT operations is now, you can see Reggie Cummings, who leads the infrastructure operations group. You see Eddie Poole, who leads solution delivery. You can see uh, Lynette Shirell, 
who leads Enterprise Command Operations. Now, Lynette has been assigned temporarily uh, over to Office of Information Security, and uh, Bob Cunningham is now acting in her stead. Dwayne Beard, as we mentioned earlier, was been, has been uh, assigned up to the PDAS role, and uh, Diane Neiman is uh, acting in his stead. Um, you see, uh, Drew Michaelgard was running the uh, product engineering organization, formerly known as Project Special Forces. Now he's been detailed to OMB. Okay, so now we'll talk a little bit about uh, Project Special Forces. Now product engineering led by Drew Michaelgard. Drew has been uh, assigned to Office of Management Budget OMB, and filling behind Drew is uh, Carrie Lee. The next uh, development organization I'd like to talk about is um, Dan McCune's Software Development and Sustainment Organization. Uh, and uh, underneath Dan, you can see Laura Petrula, who's been moved over to the Office of Electronic Health Record Modernization, and Tim McCutcheon is uh, filling behind her. And you see Tina Burnett over the Benefits and Memorials portfolio. And finally, on the right, you see Wally French, who runs the Financial System Center Systems. Uh, we're going to do a, a quick dive into the VA OIT Account Management Office. Again, I'm not going to list all of the, the pieces and parts here, but it's led by Brad Houston. And then you have the different uh, uh, account management or IT account management uh, folks, ITAMs as they're sometimes called. Uh, we go through the folks, but what I really, the point I really want to make here is that this is a very, very important office. Uh, the Account Management Office is the office where the business partners, that is VHA, VBA, NCA, and the corporate offices, this is where their needs are prioritized from an IT spend perspective. So the expectation is that the business office like VHA will come knock on the door of Howard Green, who is the acting DCIO for health. And they'll say, look, here are our priorities one to N. And then corresponding to those priorities, uh, the account management office has to translate those business priorities into IT investment priorities. And then that gets fed to the governance model. Uh, in the same way, Rob Smith is the acting uh, ITAM for benefits. Uh, VBA makes here are our one to end priorities. Those are communicated to this front door and then these priorities are translated into IT investment priorities and then offered up to the governance model for adjudication. And so, and frankly, then now you can see there also Lloyd Thrower, uh, and some folks have called this a self-licking ice cream cone because he's responsible for the priorities of the enterprise, the OIT enterprise itself, even though you know the OIT enterprise has its own budget. But it is, it's helpful and constructive to uh, distinctly and understand what our our priorities in a given year, and so that we know them, we can communicate them internally to OIT, and of course then hand them off to the, the governance situation. But I think it's important for people to understand, whether they be stakeholders or industry partners, that all kidding aside, the enterprise portfolio really isn't a self-licking ice cream cone, right? I mean, you can have, and we saw it during the pandemic, you can have world-class applications, world-class software, uh, the you know, increasing demand for remote workforce, but if you don't have bandwidth storage, End user devices and all the all the infrastructure that you need to support it. It's for naught. Exactly right. And yeah. the point I think too is that you know the folks are busy running this and keeping these systems up and running. You do need someone to manage the prioritization to th step outside the operation and think. Okay, from a business standpoint, what are our investment priorities and how do they map to the priorities of our customers? That that's a very important role. And um, so I think uh, Lloyd thrower in that role. It really uh, does a great job for OIT, and I think it's a much needed job. Well, and we saw it during the pandemic, too, just to foot stomp it one more time, is uh, not a lot of understanding of the trusted internet connection gateways, but we saw that as we went from about 50,000 remote workers on any given day to nearly 180,000, all of a sudden it became critically important. You betcha.